good to see you again. This is the final part of our negotiation textbook. So today we're going to kind of wrap up our lecture part of this class and we're going to prepare to move on to the next part of our class which is going to be a simulation or role-playing games that are going to be uh, role-playing in a negotiation context. So let's go ahead and hit this last part. <clears throat> the part we're going to be looking at today is part eight and we're going to focus on body language. And probably nothing here that you haven't heard about before. Body language you know is important. Maybe previously you had a class on uh, giving a presentation or giving a talk or maybe you've done something before where you have to present to people and everyone tells you how important body language is, right? So in this case, I'm not really going to try to tell you everything about body language, but rather I'm going to focus on body language in the context of negotiation and all the things we've talked about so far in this class and how they tie into that. So of course let's cover some of the basics. Words are only part of communication as we know. You often send information through your body language in a face-to-face -face meeting. A lot of things are not really spoken. A lot of things are um, conveyed through these different channels. These messages are sent through your behaviors, such as do you arrive late or early, the kinds of clothes you wear, uh, things like this. Now, in our RPG, we're actually going to be using avatars, not real people. But even so, you still have body language because you can use parts of your body as the avatar. And also, the way you approach and then the way you uh, uh, get closer or further away. Many of the things we do in the virtual world actually are very close to simulating that body language. So the effective use of body language, especially the way you use your hands and the way you show something's important, this can really help to make your points, your ideas clearer than without that body language. And that's an important point for speakers of English as a second language or as, uh, as another language because maybe you don't express yourself very well in that language. And so using body language helps you to make your points clear, easier to understand. So of course, if we look here at this slide, the idea is, you know, you want to have some body language, but not too much body language. So on the good side is certain um, body language stances or moves that have kind of conventional meanings compared with going a little bit crazy and extreme, which actually can make the situation more confusing rather than helpful. So being aware of a body language helps a negotiator to send signals. And remember, those signals are really important. Many negotiators, negotiators use eye contact. And eye contact can help people feel that you're being serious or that you're being honest. And lack of eye contact can make someone feel you're being dishonest. A person's body position can also show that you're interested or not interested. So these are some of the basics that are very important. If you lean backwards, it shows that you're not really interested in this. If you lean forward, it means you're listening carefully and considering the um, offer that's being made. Let's go ahead and do a dialogue for this part. Of course, in the dialogue, we can't really do much on body language, but I still want to cover some vocabulary for this last part that is very useful for your negotiation English use. So let's take a look at a negotiation situation. So Fred says, if you can give us just a bit more discount on price, I'm sure we can come to an agreement. And Alex responds, let me give you a breakdown of this situation. Now, we can't see body language here, but if you were to see it, you would say something. Like, let, let me give you a breakdown. Let me give you a breakdown. Let me show you the pieces. So you can use your hand gestures to help express this. Okay, shoot, go. Since we pay the shipping, our margin is only 12%. There is no way we can afford 
to lower the price. No way. You see, so you can use your hands, you can pull back your body to make that body language. And Fred says, we understand that, but this is pretty normal for our suppliers. And Alex responds by saying, well, it is not normal for our clients, and it is a big charge we must take. And Fred says, you will have to make a sharp decrease to your price or we will have to reject your offer. We have cheaper options, so we have alternatives. And Alex says, this is the lowest we can offer. Remember, our product is the most reliable on the market. You want the best and we have it. Um, I like this negotiation because now we've had a lot of experience talking about the different types of negotiation and clearly what we have is these two sides are trying to make their stands very clear. They're trying to hold on and not give anything up. They're very much into this distributive idea that if I lose something, you're going to gain it. If you gain it, I lose it. If I gain it, you lose it. They don't want to lose anything. So they're taking their stands. They're trying to make the other side feel or make the other side understand or think they understand what are the target prices and what is the resistance point. And Fred says, why don't we split the difference just right down the middle? And Alex says, I would like to do that, but we really are already losing money on this deal. So remember, splitting right down the middle, giving up half and half, does not always lead to what people want. The demand for your product is in decline. Now here, Fred tries to change the outcome variables a little bit by saying, actually, your product is hard to sell. And Alex says, that is an extraordinary thing to say. That is not our perspective at all. So here we have a lot of um, communication that is prime for body language because we can lean back, we can lean forward, we can say, oh, it's extraordinary, it's hard to believe. And no, no, that's not true. So we're trying to uh, insert or uh, uh, assert certain ideas and then the other side is trying to block them and then reassert other ideas. Body language can be very helpful. Fred says, it is clear there has been a sharp drop in sales. A drop. Alex says, did you consider the sales always decline during the summer and then increase in the winter? They always decline and then increase in the winter. Overall, demand is steady. Fred responds by saying, as I mentioned, we can get a better discount price from other suppliers. And Alex says, you know as well as I do, you cannot meet our quality standards. We have the best quality product in this class. And Fred responds with, the alternative suppliers are very attractive on both quality and price. This is a very real option for us. And Alex says, I can ask my boss, but I already know that this is his rock bottom price. We will lose valuable time if we don't close the deal now. And Fred wraps up by saying, I need a time out to consider this. I need a time out. Okay, so that dialogue is really a perfect situation, a perfect example of these two sides are both working on the assumption of a distributive negotiation. They're trying to make each side understand what is the target and what is the resistance. And of course, remember, when you try to make the other side see your target and when you try to make your other side see the resistance, this may not be true because you know they're going to push you, right? So you want to get as far away as you can and then just hold on for as long as you can. And by using body language here, back and forth, both sides can convey the message that they're serious. Now, alternatively, on the other side, if I'm watching your body language, if I'm looking at your body language, and when I'm seeing you, you say, this is my rock bottom price, we cannot go any further. If I look at you and I see your body language is not really saying the same thing, your body language is not saying this is the rock bottom. You're not pulling back saying this is the bottom. But rather, your body language tells me something else. 
this can give me a clue that this is not really your resistance point. This is not really rock bottom like you say. So in this way, we use body language to convey a message, but we also want to watch very carefully. What's the other side doing? What's their body language? How are they saying things? What are they doing with their hands? What are they doing with their gestures to express this? Is it really true? Okay, so let's continue a little bit here. Alex says, let's take a coffee break, and Fred says, that's fine. So again, I just reinforce this idea. Some body language is good. You don't want to go overboard and be too crazy, though, obviously, because that would be a little bit funny. Okay, let's continue on then after our little break. Alex says, after consideration, we just can't go any lower. We can't go any lower. And Fred says, my boss will never accept that. Maybe we should put off the price question for now. If there is no objection, I suggest we move on to the question of payment. Now what Fred's doing here is Fred is log rolling. He's saying, look, this point is just really hard. I don't want to give in. You don't want to give in. We both are kind of focused on this distributive idea. We're very stuck. What can we do? Do we keep negotiating? Do we keep talking about this one point? And maybe what we could do then is say, look, we're stuck. Let's go to something else. Let's change the topic to another part. Maybe let's talk about something different. And if we talk about something different, then we keep the negotiation going. And later we come back to this question. So this is called log rolling or keep things moving. And Alex says, agreed. We can revisit the price question later. Revisit means come back to it later. And Fred says, sales can be improved with more advertising. And Alex responds, that is a very good idea. And Fred comes up with this idea, but advertising is expensive. We can offer an internet advertising campa campaign only if you pay half the cost. And Alex responds with, if the advertising can show how our product is better quality, then sales could increase. This is mutually beneficial. We can accept that. So we do see here that there's an idea they can move forward on. Not so, not so hard to move forward, so we changed to this topic. This could stop the deterioration in market demand. And Alex says again, we cannot accept this assumption. You are just trying to push us down on price. We cannot go any lower. Fred keeps saying, our advertising campaign will help you increase market demand. I know your market demand is low. I'm sure it's low. And Alex keeps saying, no, no, market demand is good. You don't need to keep saying that. It's not true. Market demand is good. And Fred says, well, we see the trend clearly in our sales figures. And Alex responds with, I would like to see that data. And Fred says, that is not so simple since it's confidential. So here again, we're trying to make assertions. We're trying to change some outcomes, change the parameters. I would like to sell your product, but nobody wants to buy it. If nobody wants to buy it, you have to lower the price so I can you know, pay and then take the risk that nobody will buy, right? And then the other side says, no, no, lots of people want to buy it. This is not true. Okay, can you show me the information? Oh, no, no, that's secret information. I can't show you. So both sides trying to affect each other's side's evaluation of the outcome, of the resistance point, of the target prices. Let's take a look at some of the vocabulary we picked up on this part. Afford, meaning we can afford it or we can't afford it. We can't afford that. Certainly, you can afford this small increase. A bit, meaning a small amount. Can you give me a bit? I can give up a bit. I can give up a bit on the price. Bit. Breakdown. Show me the details, right? Show me the information. Can you give me a breakdown on this price? Decline, going down. So decline. Your sales have been declining for five years. Demand. What is the market demand? That is 
how many people or what is the size of the market that people will, how much are they willing to spend, how much are they willing to buy of your product, right? So the demand has been declining or I clearly see demand as the major problem or if you can increase quality, we can increase demand. Deteriorate, also about going down. You can see a lot of these words about trying to say that the other side's sales are going down or not strong. Deteriorate, our sales are deteriorating. Discount price, so that means some kind of lower price off of the public offering price or the sticker price or the retail, suggested retail price. So this discount price is lower. Can you give us a discount price? Extraordinary, meaning very special, something that's extra. And usually you would say, I'm going to give you an extraordinary offer. Increase, make something larger. Can you increase your discount? Margin. So margin is the difference between the cost and the price. We might think about this as profit margin, but usually it's not that simple because you could have tax and other things. So this margin could be like gross margin. Just what's the difference between your cost to manufacture it and the price you sell it at? And so I could say something like, I'm already selling this product to you below margin. It means I'm losing money, below margin. Option. This option means you have other options, another choice, another way to do something. We don't have any other options. We must get a lower price. Quality standard, that's a great little phrase, the quality standard. That means what's the normal quality? The quality standard in the market is far above your quality reliable meaning you can count on they do it well they do it the same way every time they don't forget or fall down or do something wrong reliable a product can be reliable and that it doesn't break easily a negotiator a person can be reliable meaning you can depend on them we have created we have manufactured that's good we have manufactured a reliable product for 20 years. Rock bottom, rock bottom. This means, this is my lowest price. Now what this really means is your resistance point. This is my resistance point, rock bottom price. That would be from the seller's perspective. I will not go any lower. Sharp, meaning very quickly. So a sharp change can go sharply down or sharply up. Sales have drop sharply. There is a sharp decrease in your sales over the past two years. Steady is kind of the opposite of sharp, meaning changing slowly over a long period of time. Sales have been steady for the last five years. Time out, take a break. Time out is a great way in your negotiation to slow things down a little bit or to say, let's take a break and then we can change topics so we can keep it moving forward. So let's take a time out. Let's have a time out. What about a time out now? I could use a time out. Unacceptable. We cannot accept it. Your offer is unacceptable. This price discount is unacceptable. Very, meaning exceedingly or much right? This is already a very large discount. We cannot give you any more. This very large discount is already below our margins. Okay, let's just follow up then very quickly with some more of our body language ideas. Probably one of the key points in negotiation body language is going to be talking about I contact. Eye contact. Eye contact. Why is that so important? Because when you negotiate, you're going to be looking at each other, right? And that eye contact really is a way that humans try to understand, can I trust you? So if you look directly at the person you're negotiating with, 
They feel that you're being more honest than if you look away. They also feel you're being more serious. If you're not looking at a person directly with eye contact, they think maybe you're hiding something, you're not telling the truth, or you're not serious. Now, in our RPG, we're going to be using virtual avatars, but still, if your avatar is facing the other way and your back is to me and you're talking, uh, that makes me feel a little bit weird. If you can manipulate your avatar more, if you can really control your avatar to see the other person, to show the other person closely, to give some facial expression, which our program can do. And don't forget, they're looking at the computer screen, they're looking out of their avatar's eye, so they see you there. So the more you can maybe use your avatar to give expressions, to give body language, to be right in front of the person you're talking to, probably this will convey a feeling of you're telling the truth, you're serious. Whereas if your avatar is just far away or their back is to them and they're not, don't have good audio, then they're going to be maybe thinking you're not taking things serious. Of course, in person to person, we want to pay attention and not stare too long. In some cultures, it's actually bad habits to stare for a long time at someone. And you don't want to stare like you're you know, some kind of ghost or something. Staring makes people feel uncomfortable, especially if there's no speaking or other body language. Try to make contact with the with another person on the other team. This is always a good idea that when your team is negotiating with another team, maybe your team has three people or four people and the other, people, other team has three or four or five people, it's really a good idea if you can at least pick out one person on the other team that you communicate with well, that you give good body language signals to and that person may begin to feel that you have some kind of connection, they understand you. That can help you in the future when you're trying to move forward in the negotiation, to have someone on the team that has some empathy towards you. By making eye contact with everyone, you tell them that you're serious. So you try to kind of pick up on one or two people in the group, but don't forget, don't just focus on one person. When you're speaking, make sure you speak to everyone. Because although you would like to make friends with one or two people, you also don't want to alienate or make someone else feel uncomfortable by not addressing everyone. So it's a little bit of a balance. Okay, let's take a little bit of a look at facial expressions. Things are, some things are really basic, like smiles and frowns are fairly universal across cultures, and this makes people feel comfortable if you have a nice smile, and if you have a frown, you look sad, this can make people look un feel uncomfortable. Make sure your facial expressions match the subject you're talking about. Now, this sounds so simple, this sounds so uh, basic, this sounds so easy that it seems like you shouldn't even mention it. But in reality, it's not that easy, it's not that simple in my experience. And what this means is, or what I'm, the reason for this is, when you talk to people, you don't see yourself, you see them. So if you took a video camera and you filmed yourself, or if you looked in a mirror while you're talking, you may see something that's different than what you think you're projecting, than the way you think your facial expressions are uh, projecting out. So what I'm trying to say is you need to kind of think about it rather than just take it as granted, just do it. You need to think about it. Am I smiling when I'm making this point? Am I giving the right frown when I need to? Am I, do, I have, do I have a neutral face when I need to? Do I nod when it's the right time? We need to really think about it. And by thinking about it mentally, you kind of get a mental picture about it, which means you kind of practice it in your mind a little bit. Even more important is to use your facial expressions to send a message than just to make people feel comfortable, right? So in our negotiation, we're actually gonna to try to send a message. And if your facial expression sends the wrong message or is a little bit different, then this is really going to hurt you. And when I say different, I mean different from what you want the other side to receive, right? If you're trying to tell them, this is my lowest price, and it really is not your lowest price, then you're, you need to make your facial expression make the other side feel this really is your lowest price, you see? So that is not such an easy thing to do. You can use a surprise face, for example, 
to make the other side feel that the price is too high or too low depending on if you're a buyer or seller. So let's talk about that just for a second. Surprise. <gasps> that's too That's too much. We can't do that. You're asking for too much. Disc it's good. The discount you want is, is too huge. There's no way. So that kind of surprise. But if you're really surprised, right? If somebody tells you a price and you're really surprised, the problem with being really surprised is that you give away some of your secret information, right? This is why it's so important before you negotiate, your team get together and look at what are your goals. What's your goal package? What's your resistance point? What's your target price? Because you need to get these together. And then you need to, in the negotiation, give those, like, surprise when somebody says something that is above or below, depending if you're buyer or seller, on what you are making them think is your target price, or what you are making them think is your resistance point. Begin with a relaxed and pleasant smile when you begin a negotiation. Being friendly at the start will help everybody feel a little bit more comfortable. You don't want to begin a negotiation with a lot of conflict or hostility because it's already going to be hard enough to move forward. Also, if you begin friendly, this may help the other side to begin more friendly and to move away from a tough position if they're planning to be tough or confrontational with you. A friendly face also hides your true plans, right? You don't want to give away plans through your facial expression. So by being friendly, it makes people a little bit mm, feel more comfortable and does not give away any of your secret information. This kind of friendly, neutral phrase, not super happy, but just kind of neutral. This is what we call a poker face. And a poker face means like if you're playing poker cards, if you're playing cards, it, a poker face means a person cannot tell anything from your face. It's neutral. And not neutral like, like you're dead. But neutral more like, a mm -hmm. little bit of a smile, a little bit okay, relaxed. I, I'm hearing you. I'm feeling comfortable. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. Mm -hmm. But you can't tell anything from what I'm saying. You can't tell any of my secret information from my face. Poker face. A person with a poker face is hard to read. This helps to keep your secret information secret. So keeping that poker face, just looking at your other uh, counterparts, giving them a nice nods and understanding, but not giving away your information. Okay, make your initial offer in a calm way. Lean forward, be friendly. You lean forward, I'm gonna give you something, here's my offer. This approach kind of shows you're being honest, you're being friendly, and you're positive. You wanna move forward. Try to speak clearly. Be careful not to talk too fast. When you speak fast, some people get confused. They may get something mixed up. You don't want to have a negotiation where the other side hears something you didn't say, where they get the numbers wrong, and then you're arguing over numbers that are not your real numbers. So speak slowly, clearly. Wait as they listen. Maybe they'll nod and say, yes, I see. You can even slow down and say something. Does that make sense? Do you understand that? Our price is $22.50. 2250. You got that? 2250. Showing surprise when you hear the other side's counter offer can can make the other side think that this is your resistance point. You're very close to the resistance point. That's what surprise does. These signals cannot go much further in the negotiation. It's saying, hey, I'm so surprised we can't really move forward. Right? Shocking. Whoa, 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 too high, too high. There's no way we can do that, right? So that kind of surprise helps to convey that idea. Positive listening. Positive li listening, or what's called active listening, this means that you give feedback to the other side. You make the other side feel that you really are listening to them, that you really are understanding them. This is really key. 
When a negotiation is going well, the listener can appear positive. You can smile. Every couple sentences, you can nod your head as you're listening. And you can even repeat the point. So you can say something like, Ah,、oh, yes, I see. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, $22.50? Oh, right. Okay. And that can be shipped in one month, 30 days? Okay, okay. So you be positive, you give the feedback, you repeat some points. Now, you may not be really listening because you already have your target. But what this does is it makes the other side feel that you really understand them. And then when you give your counter offer or you say that something is not possible or it's past your resistance point, they're more likely to believe you're telling the truth. Because you were active listening, you understood them. Because what's going to happen is when you first offer your counter offer, the other side is going to accuse you of not understanding their main point. They're going to say, hey, you didn't really understand what I offered. When negotiation is going, is going well, the listener can appear positive, and every couple sentences, nod your head, repeat the point. When negotiation is not going very well, the listener can be negative in order to signal that you don't agree with this. And some ways you can do this is closing the eyes a little bit, leaning back some. Use the hands in front of the face as if you're thinking or、uh, kind of feeling some kind of problem, looking distracted. So, this would be into the negotiation a little bit, and then we're talking for some time. Maybe we have an out,、uh, offer, counter offer, another offer, another counter offer. And then I begin to say, ah,、oh. you see, so I'm signaling you. I don't know. This is not possible. This. I don't think so. I don't know.、Mm -mm. You see, so at beginning I'm positive. I'm listening. I understand you. Now we make some progress, and then I'm signaling you. This is my resistance point. This is my resistance point. That's the kind of signal I want to give you. If the negotiator does not want to look either positive or negative, then you just use the poker face, right? And this kind of hides everything. Don't look positive, don't look negative. That's the poker face. Just look straight ahead, keep your eyes open, maybe give a few nods. The hands can be put together in front of the face as if you're thinking or contemplating, right? Contemplating or thinking, like something like this. No clue. Do I agree, disagree, right? But that also means you cannot show surprise. And when you show surprise, you're signaling resistance point. So, poker face is good sometimes, but not all the time, right? Because you do want to kind of lead the other side to believe something. Now, how can you、uh, kind of develop these expressions? Well, you can practice them. And good negotiators understand their own body language, their own facial expressions. Now, one way you can do this is just practice it in a mirror, of course. So you go in front of a mirror and you practice your facial expressions. You, you practice them with some of the phrases that we've learned in this part and other parts. So, for example, a positive reaction can be used when you want to signal the other side you agree with something or they change into a direction you agree with. So you can be positive, you can be serious. Meaning that you show that this is something you're listening to, or the point you are making is in fact very serious. So you look ahead, a little bit stern, not looking too happy, but look, leaning forward and saying, This is an important point. Surprise is you use when you want to signal you're getting near my resistance point, or if something has changed. And you don't like the direction it's going in, you can act surprised. You pull back a little bit, take your breath in, have a little bit of a shocking、uh, reaction. When you want to be negative, negative is usually a reaction that shows you're shocked at the other side. There's something that the other side's done that you don't agree with, and I'm going to withdraw from the negotiation very soon. So, this negative approach signals the other side. You're near your resistance point. Negative emphasis is used to reinforce the information is 
is not being accepted, the spoken information you don't agree with. It has a negative meaning. So you kind of give more of a frown, your eyes may be more open as you stare ahead, and you don't look very happy about things. Also, you need to think about it, so you lean back, maybe close your eyes, maybe uh, be quiet for a little while, and close your mouth and you're thinking about it, staring off into space or into your mind. And this shows that you're thinking about it very seriously, but you're not agreeing with it. It may be a problem, it may be difficult. Now, if you look away or you lean very far back or you look at other things like a computer or a tablet or a book or a paper, this is showing that I'm not really interested and I may withdraw from the negotiation. You're not giving me anything I'm interested in, so you're looking away. What about hand movements? Hand movements can be very helpful also. I think actually hand movements we often use when we talk about things like decline, increases, this is all we can offer you. There's nothing more I can do. I'm, I'm stuck. I have to talk to my boss before I can give you anything. Effective use of the hands is key, but you don't want to go overboard, right? You don't want to be waving your hands all over the place. Even more important is this idea that you need to probably control your hands. That means that we're often using our hands. Sometimes we're holding our hands in tight here, we're putting them in our pocket down here, we're putting them under the desk, we're putting them up here. The position of your hands can give away a lot of information. So to control that, you want to actively think, what are my hands doing that make my point to the other side, that make the other side or help the other side believe what I'm saying is true, right? We cannot accept this price because your sales have been going down. How do you compare that to, we can't accept this price, your sales have been going down. You see that leaning forward, the hand gestures make you feel that what I'm saying is really what I believe. So hand gestures are something that maybe you cannot make the other side believe something is not true, but at least you must control your hand gestures because if you're not careful, they will give away or signal your secret information and you don't even know it. When the hands are pulled back and placed near the body or in the pockets or under the table, usually that's negative and it may also show that you're not really telling the truth. Okay, I think that uh, covers up uh, pretty well right there. Let me get some of our stuff here. So what I'd like to do is, very quickly, I'm going to just sum this up, right? So this eight parts we've covered, and we began not really knowing anything about negotiation. And we talked about finding out what are your goals, how to measure success or failure in a negotiation, and negotiation is not just about always getting the lowest price no matter what. Rather, it's thinking about what is you want, what's your goal package, how to prioritize, then how to make a plan, and how to select a strategy, then how to execute tactics to obtain your, to implement your strategy and obtain your goal package, right? So all of this, the most important thing is get ready beforehand. Talk with your team. Work with your team. Make sure everybody on your team understands the goal package, the resistance point, the target prices. If everybody understands these things and what you're going to convey to the other side, then you have a unified team, much more likely to succeed, especially if your team needs to spread out and talk to different buyers or different sellers at the same time because you have some time pressure, like what will happen in our RPG game. And then we get down to the really practical stuff. You know, what are the actual words you say? What are the sentences you say? The phrases you say? We've studied that. And then what's the body language you actually use? We've looked at that. All of these things come together in negotiation. And I think the best lesson to take away is that if you come into a negotiation unprepared, thinking you're just going to wing it, most people will not succeed. You will be badly beaten by the other side. 
and you probably won't even know it because the other side will make you feel, make you think that what you're getting is already at their resistance point. They're already losing money. They're doing bad. They're giving you so much already and you feel good and you feel you've done a good job, but actually they're the ones that have done a good job and you've lost. I want to emphasize this idea of the other side will always try to make you think they're doing you a favor. They're trying to help you. They're trying to work with you. They're trying to integrate in their strategy. But in reality, they may actually be using a distributive approach. They're trying to get more from you under the idea they want to give up less. Everything that you give up, they feel is a, is a win for them. And everything they give up would be a loss for them. So although it's wonderful and lovely to think that we can have this integrative negotiation, what's the problem with that? If you're practicing integrative and the other side is practicing distributive, you will be on the short end. You will be losing. So good luck with your negotiation. Take them serious. Plan beforehand. Get your goals. Think of your strategy all the way down to your tactics, all the way down to your body language, all the way down to the way you dress and the way you look. And in that way, push everything forward and be conscious about it in your negotiation. And then you're much more likely to win especially if the other side is not as prepared as you are. So good luck in your negotiations.